Um, hi. Um, so I'm going to try and go a little faster in order to save a little time. Uh, my name is Daniel Charbiola. I have uh, this work is uh, through collaboration with uh, between UCLA and IBM Research. Uh, Ting, who's from IBM Research, is uh, in the audience today. And uh, Yangan Saraf Suprio and my professor uh, advisor Mani uh, from UCLA and Hachik from IBM. Um, so yeah, this uh, talk is about uh, this paper is about using compressed sensing um, in sensor networks. Uh, most people who know and use compressed sensing uh, use it for compression, and what we found is that you can use compressed sensing quite easily and conveniently and cheaply for adding robustness uh, to channel errors as well. Um, so I'll start with a big picture. Um, you, in, in a typical sensor network, you, you need to record something in your environment. I've shown this little bird. Maybe you want to record that in, in the forest. And uh, there's a sensor node that uh, is recording, let's say, the acoustic waveform. And so what we usually do is we, we uh, record the waveform and we send it out over the channel. And if that channel had a uh, loss in it, some bits are going to disappear. We are not going to get everything. So how do we recover from this loss? Typically, you will do a retransmission. So you'll know which ones you missed, and you'll send just those packets. That's one way. The second way is to do some sort of forward error correction. So what you do is you generate some error correction bits before you send out um, your, your data. And then you send out those error correction bits. And um, hopefully, they all reach the other side. And through some uh, decoding mechanism, you'll get uh, your original signal back. So the question we wanted to ask was, can we do anything better than this? And so we're, what we are proposing is using compressed sensing to do this. And so we've got the, the same waveform being recorded by, uh, by the sensor node. And instead of sending it directly, it's going to compute something called compressed measurements or some random measurements. Um, for those who know compressed sensing, you know what this is. Uh, for those who don't, I'm going to give you a quick intro to compressed sensing a little bit later. Um, so we send these compressed measurements, and some bits, again, are going to be lost. And through um, some decoding uh, mechanisms, we can get the original signal back with much fewer data. So the question is, how does this work? Um, so we, here we use the knowledge of the signal and of the channel. And so that's why there is no magic. We are using more information. We are using more knowledge to do this. Um, compressed sensing uses uh, randomized sampling or randomized projections. And so what happens is that the random losses in the channel actually look like additional randomness within the sampling process. So that's really the intuition or the trick behind why this works. And the rest of this talk is going to focus on how this works and how well this works. Um, so I'm going to go into a quick intro to compressed sensing, and then we'll go into uh, the details of the rest. So firstly, why compressed sensing? Um, typically, when we, when we do our uh, sensing, we have some physical signal. We sample it. We compress it. We communicate it uh, and send it to the application. But the compression step is t usually the more computationally expensive if it's not the communication step. And so what we are saying here is that uh, by using compressed sensing, we are moving that computation block to the other side of the communication link uh, to a more capable server. Um, to give you an intuition about how compressed sensing works, so if you've got a signal which has some bandwidth and you want to acquire the signal, what you typically do is use the Nyquist rate and you say, we're going to sample it at twice the bandwidth. But what if you knew something more about the signal? For example, that it occupied this band, but there were very few frequencies within the band themselves. So compressed sensing is a, a theory of a theoretical framework that allows you to acquire the signal based on its information content rather than its bandwidth content. So we, we just think of it in that, in that way. So how does this work? I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a feel. Um, and I'm going to try and be as quick as possible, but um, we can talk offline if, if something's uh, missed out here. So we, we usually acquire signals in the time or the space dimension. And, but by looking at the signal in another dimension, we can maybe compact, uh, represent the signal more compactly. For example, a sine wave can be expressed by three parameters, its frequencies, amplitude, and its phase. And um, in this case, uh, if, you com if you convert a sine wave into the frequency domain by using the FFT, it's the FFT coefficient 
um, the position of, its, of the coefficient and its value that is of interest to us, really. So for example, um, I've got a sine wave here and the FFT here, and the sine wave, we call it sparse in the frequency domain because it's, it's got a singularity in the frequency domain, and most of the information is within that one spike and everything else is zeros. Um, so let's say we wanted to acquire a sine wave, right? Uh, and to simplify the argument, I'm just gonna say it's in a noiseless environment. So an infinite duration sine wave can be represented by these three parameters. And the question is, what's the best way to find these three parameters, right? So technically, if you have three parameters, there's three unknowns, you need three good measurements. The questions then are, what are good measurements? And how do you estimate the three parameters from those measurements? Um, so what compressed sensing says is that, okay, you've got three samples, let's call them Z1, Z2, and Z3, of this sine wave, and let's say at, they are at times T1, T2, and T3, so, um, you know that the solution of uh, F, A, and phi must meet these three constraints, uh, which are that Z, I is equal to X of T, I, right, for one, two, and three. So which means that you've got this signal, uh, you wanna find where in this 3D space this signal lies. And so if you, if you have these three constraints, your feasible solution space is actually smaller than the entire 3D space. It's still quite a big space. But as you add more measurements, your feasible space shrinks. And if you knew that you had only one sine wave, doing an exhaustive search over that entire 3D space will give you the right answer. All right? Um, so I'm going to try and put it into a few um, uh, uh, mathematical terms or linear algebra terms. So you've got your sine wave there on the, on the right. And I'm going to represent that as a vector x. And um, since the Fourier uh, operation is a linear operation, we can, we can represent that as a matrix multiplication. So I've got this Fourier transform as this uh, colorful matrix. And so phi times x will give you the, um, the FFT representation, which is y, which is your spike again. And so there's one non-zero entry here, and uh, the rest of the entries are, are zero. So you've got one equation, which is y is equal to psi times x. Uh, where this guy is your a, f, and phi. Um, and we can also write the sampling matrix as um, a, a linear operation in matrix operations. So you've got x, and this is your sampling matrix phi, which has three non-zero entries, and your z's are your measurements. And this is the three dots here are your three measurements. This is just a representation for, for understanding this. So you've got these three non-zero entries at some good locations, and you've got those three measurements, all right? And so we're gonna say the size of Z is K and the size of X is N. So you've got K measurements, and you want to reconstruct N. So your compression ratio is really uh, K over N or N over K. Um, so now the, we can write this exhaustive search as, um, as a more mathematical formulation. And we'd say, okay, the, ob the objective of the ex exhaustive search is to find an estimate of this y that meets the constraints such that it's a compact representation of x in that domain. So these are your constraints. Z is equal to phi times x. This is your sampling matrix. This is your Fourier conversion matrix. So z is equal to phi times psi inverse times y. And um, this exhaustive search objective can be written as um, uh, this optimization problem uh, which is uh, something called the L0 optimization, where L0 norm is uh, the number of non-zeros. So essentially, you're trying to find the sparsest representation. Unfortunately, this optimization problem is NP-hard. Um, the big leap that happened a few years ago, about five years ago in compressed sensing, was that you could approximate this L0 norm to the L1 norm, which is essentially saying that instead of uh, optimizing the non-zero values, you optimize the sum of magnitudes of those values. And what they showed was that under the right conditions, that approximation, the relaxation from L0 to L1 was exact. You get the same, same answer. And um, so what, was, what are those right conditions? Those conditions, uh, again, surprisingly, are that if those K samples of an n-length um, signal were acquired uniformly randomly, which means that if the samples 
are equiprobable across that sine wave, then the reconstruction and the reconstruction is performed in the Fourier basis, in this case for the Fourier basis, then this bound holds where S is the sparsity of the signal, which is that if it's one sine wave, S is equal to one, and K is the number of uh, samples that you need. So how does this all relate to um, our problem? So typically, again, we are saying we, we sample and we compress and we get those compressed domain samples. If you had a communication link that was lossy, you'd have missing samples at the end. So what you do is you can use retransmissions, as I said, or you could use these erasure or error correcting codes. And so you'll have a channel decoding, a channel coding block before you communicate and a channel encoding block before, after, you, uh, after you receive the samples and you'll recover your compressed domain samples that you that you uh, uh, computed before. Okay, so for now you can ignore all of the, all of the notation. 